Hey, this is John from Pinet Comics, and if my co-host Lloyd was here, he would tell you a couple things about this show. Number one, we swear way too fucking much. And number two, we drop spoilers without any warning. Now that you know that, listen in and enjoy the show. Is that Slavic? No. Oh, about a nine on the tension scale, Rube. Welcome back to another episode of Pine and Comics. I always say welcome back. I'm assuming you've listened to this before. If you have not listened to this before, my name's John. This is Pine and Comics. It's a podcast. The word comics is in it. That's kind of bullshit. And uh, I've thought about changing the name, but I don't know. I've thought, fuck it. At this point, we're 200 and some odd episodes in. Figure it out. <laughs> Uh, with me tonight, we've got some great guests on tonight, good friends, people I've met in the last couple of years through uh, through various comic cons and cult classics, you know them all. Shawnee Mac, Shawnee, what's going on, man? Hey, John, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. It's I'm great good. to be back, and I'll tell you what, it's great to be back in this venue. Yeah, you know, this is the long. first time since, uh, yes. since the world stopped. Yeah. Wow. Wow, that's right. It's yeah. beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. Good to have you here. You got your Dunkin' Donuts coffee, you're comfortable, you're ready to go. Let's rock. You got your one little... <laughs> Your one little uh, note on a uh, on a sticky uh, one, and not even a sticky pad, a sticky note. Hey, leave my post it alone. The <laughs> post it. That's the word. A lot I was of thought for. on that post it note. <laughs> Tonight we got a first time guest. He's been on the radio show before, but he's never been on the podcast. And we've been trying to get him up here. He lives in the in the deep woods of Simsbury, Connecticut. All right, and he lives he lives way up there. It's Sal from Robber Barons Inc. Sal, what's going on, man? Not much. Glad to finally be here. It's uh, we talked about it a while, and we finally made it happen. You know, we certainly have. Uh, tell everybody out there. I love Robert Berenzing. Tell everybody out there what it is. Uh, we're a t-shirt apparel, other things company like pop culture, uh, witty uh, food, all kinds of variety of t-shirts. Uh, we have a whole sort of stuff that's uh, sort of Star Warsy related. Yep. We have food nonsense. Uh, basically, anything we like wearing and we feel like putting on a shirt, we put on a shirt. So it's kind of covers the gamut of stuff. Do you think it's a little bit presumptuous of you to call your like what your business witty? At yeah, any point? it's not really, but I just feel like I have to say that to sell it. <laughs> no, it's fine. You don't have to sell it. Give everybody the website out there because I want them. I want I, I love your stuff so much. I want them to stop listening to this episode for a few seconds. Put it on pause. Okay. Open up another window that's not Pornhub and go to Robert Baron Zinc. RobertBaronZinc.com, and that's I-N-K. Right, not I-N-C. Yeah, Funk. Shout out to Funk. Shout Gotta out to Funk. That. I love all of you guys. Uh, we've got Funk. Yep. Okay. Uh, Funkomania running wild. We've got Chef Andy, who for a long time I didn't believe was a real person. And he's still not. That was an actor. Was that an actor? Do you guys hire? <laughs> yeah. Was that a, what no they, one's really that weird. Like a super deep fake. And then Russo. How's Russo doing? Russo's doing good. You know. Russo's got one of my favorite Instagrams because Russo, is Russo a vegetarian or a vegan? Uh, It varies. I don't know. I think he's mostly vegan now, but I don't want to speak for him. But he's been vegan. He's been a vegetarian. He's eaten meat. It, he's a foodie, it, though. Like, Yeah, well, he loves food. His Instagram is always mushroom sandwiches and shit like that. Like, And I'm not even into all the food he eats, but... It always looks really good. Yeah, he puts on like a whole presentation there. He puts on like a like a, a charcuterie board, but instead of with meat, it's got like, you know, avocado and other interesting things. Yeah, we're still waiting for our invite to try it. So I, you're, how good it is, is you're, as good a guess as mine. All right. Uh, another interesting fact about you um, is that you have many times besmirched our uh, Piney Comics being pro-raisin, <laughs> our love of raisins. And I want to ask both of you. Uh, you hate raisins, right? Raisins are garbage. Sean, how do you feel about raisins? Um, I don't believe they're garbage, but, um, they're okay. I mean, raisinettes, come on. Right. Well, no, you're automatically, though, I mean, I'm just saying straight raisins, no chocolate No on chocolate. Them. Oh, yeah, fuck that shit. Okay, really? <laughs> it's nature's candy. What about, ask him, what do you think of olives? Oh, probably the worst thing on it, the texture, everything oh. about it, the worst. I'm sorry. That's beautiful, the Sean. Pit. What do you do with the pit? Nothing, you know, what do you yeah. do? There's nothing, it's, it's ridiculous. Now we we have we, that that did work out very well because I was worried <laughs> I was going to get ganged up on because I hate olives. Now I don't know if I've ever asked you. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna make that part of your five questions. We got five questions for you. 
All right, you ready? Sure. This is usually Lloyd's thing, but Lloyd's not around right now, so I'm going to take care of the five questions that I have for a while. I'm going to start off with an olive-based question. Black or green? Green. And why? They just have more flavor. I like both, but green are, I don't know, they're stronger flavor. By more flavor, do you mean just salt? Yeah, more yeah. salt. You know, you have the little pimento in the middle there. Sometimes it's a little extra something for you. All right. <laughs> All right, that's fair. I don't know if I, I don't know if I agree with that totally. <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely do not. I'm sorry. Yeah, I hate olives, but <laughs> all right. Uh, question number two. This is one I've thrown in there recently. All right, you ready? Someone hands you a box, a carton of Neapolitan ice cream. All right, chocolate, vanilla, strawberry. What order do you eat them in based on how much you like them? I heard you talk about this on something else, and I definitely disagreed. I would chocolate, vanilla, strawberry. Oh, because strawberry is the best. So you're, and that's my opinion. So you're no. going, no, no, strawberry is the worst. That's why it's like I'll eat it because it's still ice cream. But like I'm going to the cho- actually chocolate and vanilla mixed together is the best. But strawberry, I'll eat it, but it's not my favorite. Okay, Sean. I mean, I'm because you're here. I gotta ask, where do you go? What do you eat? And what so order? I, I would agree with Sal, but you saved the best for last. The strawberry is the best to me. Okay, so what are you starting with? <laughs> if you're going with like worst first, vanilla. Vanilla. Okay. So vanilla is just vanilla. So you would go vanilla to get it out of the way. So opposite, if you were to say best, you would say strawberry, chocolate, vanilla. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. Fair. All right. Here's another food-based one for you. Ready? Pudding or Jello? That's a tough one. Um, Put yourself in like third grade. You're, pudding. You got to grab yourself. I got to go pudding. You're going pudding. Some chocolate pudding. You know, can't go wrong there. Okay. Jello is just kind of there. Yeah. I'm not a huge fan of Jello. I do like Jello when it has the fruit in it. Uh, no uh, no all right all right uh we're gonna go with food based one again this is one that i i retired for a while but i want to hear it from you because i don't know if we've ever talked about this before starburst all right give me the order from worst to best starburst flavors i knew this was coming and every time i hear you guys talk about it i'm like sorry your take is garbage so are you gonna go strawberry is the best no, okay. I'm gonna go. Lemon is the best. Oh no, I'm not. No, you said your take. You mean the the guest or me? Uh, you. But hang on, hang okay. on. Second is the infamous pink. Oh, you're so fucking wrong about this. Okay, what's so lemon? No, you've already you're already wrong because cherry's got to be in the top two if anything. No, but. cherry cherry and orange are like tied for. You gotta pick. You gotta good, pick. But, Sophie's okay. choice. So it goes lemon, pink, whatever that is. Strawberry. Cherry and orange. Okay. All right. Sean, what are you going to go with? I am going to plead the fifth because I don't eat that. Okay. At all. So I couldn't even tell you what flavors are in it. Now, okay. So, the, like, you said I don't eat that. Like, it's a religious choice. Like, yeah, I don't eat that shit. You don't like, no. like, fruity candy is what you mean? Or you don't like... Uh, that's a good question. I don't like Skittles either. Okay. Maybe I have hmm. something against fruity candy. I think I you never do. thought about it that way. Are you a chocolate fan? Yeah. Okay, modern. Not dark chocolate. I hate dark chocolate. Oh, I love dark chocolate. Oh, milk chocolate for me. Oh, man. Boring. All right. <laughs> All right, last one. Now, we talked about this a little bit earlier with Russo, and beforehand we talked about this, that at one point in your life you were a vegetarian. Now you kind of lean vegetarian, but you still eat chicken and, and seafood. Yep. But in your vegetarian days, if you had to eat either one of those fake-ass hot dogs or one of those fake-ass hamburgers, and I'm saying you pick... Whoever makes the best one of either one of those, what are you going for first? Uh, probably a veggie burger, just because you're more likely to have a better fake hamburger. But some of the fake hot dogs are okay, but some of them are horrible. Yeah, you, you really got to be selective. There's a couple brands, like there's some that just are like rolled up like a cigar, like it just it's not good. So I could do either, but. I'm more likely a, a veggie burger is more likely to be better than a hot dog. My wife was a vegetarian uh, for several years. And uh, right when we bought the house uh, like 10, 12 years ago, and we used to barbecue more often and I would make myself like bratwurst and then she would get her, you know, her veggie dogs. And I always had the feeling that I was grilling like a Barbie doll's leg. Cause that's what it looked like. Sean, have you ever grilled a veggie dog? Uh, negative. It doesn't Probably look like not. it cooks. Yeah. Occasionally, it would just get like scorch marks on it, and then once in a while, it would bubble a little bit. Like, yeah, they they do this weird natural, things, yeah. and they have gotten better because more people are vegetarian now. I think, but I'm generally not as into the fake meats. I, I like if I'm doing a veggie burger, 
I, I guess I've been trained by uh, Chef Andy. You know, he's like, oh, just, you know, grind up a bunch of vegetables and some mushrooms and breadcrumbs and put it in there. And it's it's just as easy, basically. Because a lot of that fake stuff is weird. Okay. All right. Now, just to go back, you said chicken and seafood. I get it that neither one of these is on your plate now. But in the old days, like pre any kind of vegetarian, pre chicken seafood, straight up regular hot dog or hamburger. You're at a barbecue. Someone says, hot dog or hamburger, Sal? What are you getting? A uh, hot dog. Hot dog. I was never that into beef, to be honest. And that's why one of the reasons why I stopped eating meat, it was like it wasn't a huge adjustment. Okay. So I like a steak I was never into. So. You would not have lasted in my house when I was a kid, man. <laughs> no, I would eat it, but it just wasn't my favorite thing. We ate steak like three nights a week as my father. And and then I went to college, and it was one of those things you're in the cafeteria, and the meat there was just like gray patties, like barf burgers, you yeah. know? And so I, it was like I was always eating the salad bar and the pizza and whatever, and next thing I know, it was like, well, why am I even eating this? And you just kind of get stuck in, in your habits, I guess. But eventually – I did sell out, I guess, because variety, you can only eat so much pasta when you go out to a restaurant, you know? Right. And you also (laughs) mentioned that you're addicted to cheese kind of, right? Yeah. I mean, I was never vegan, so let's not get carried away here. All right. Sean, (laughs) you come over to my house for barbecue. I say, Sean, what do you want first? Hot dog, hamburger. What are you getting? One of each. You're you're just splitting it to Hook it to my arms. Sean's going to take the the hot dog. He's he's going to wrap the hamburger in it and then put it in a bun. Yeah. Multiple. Multiple. multiple, yeah, multiple dogs in there. Let's let's do it. All right, you got no problem with that. All right, <laughs> we only live once and not for a very long time. So <laughs> That's let's... right. Yeah, he's like, what are these guys talking about? We've got a finite space here. All right, uh, uh, Sal, Pint Movie Invitational. Uh, this is the one of the three last episodes. We're done with this format. We're gonna start next year picking our own movies and inviting you guys to come out and talk about them. Now, initially, you had picked Heat, okay? Yep. And you were you were going back and forth, and I told you. To go with your second choice, because Heat is one of my favorite movies of all time. We we certainly will do that. So you're welcome back for that. Sure. So what did you pick, and why did you pick it? I picked The Burbs. Uh, overall, because I think it's a little more fun, while I loved Heat, I think this is a little, lot more fun and a kind of obscure movie. And I this movie, I remember renting it from like a video store probably in 1989 or 90, whenever it came out. And I just instantly loved it, and I've always loved it. And I actually didn't realize it had a following until the last several years. And it it's like, you know, uh, Courtney Gaines being at Horror Fest and stuff. It was like, oh, I, everyone else loves this. And I've just, I like, it's one of those movies I watch so many times, I practically have it memorized. Through the podcast, it's come up, like, multiple times. I've heard you mention you've never seen it. Never and I was saw like, it. That would be, like, you got to correct that. So it's a killing two birds with one stone here. It's fair. It's fair. Sean, have you ever seen The Birds before this? I did. I saw it on video, you know, 1990 or whenever it came out on VHS. So you're not, like, you're not one of these people that is, like, hardcore Burbs fan. No, I mean, I liked it, but yeah, I was like 12 when it came out. Okay. Because and- I'll be honest, like like he said, like, this is one of those movies that whenever I mention I've never seen it, people are like, are you fucking nuts? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, calm down there. Like, because the thing is, is I, I consider this to be kind of like, like in that, there, there was, so Tom Hanks' career kind of starts off Bosom Buddies. He makes a couple of like Bachelor Party, a couple of like those type of movies, right? Volunteers. And then he does Big. And Big is like, you, Big is where you think he should have shot through the roof. But then right after Big, he kind of went down this slope again for a while. This movie, The Burbs, Joe vs. the Volcano. Yes, very yeah. weird. Very he kind of had this – Big didn't yeah. really catch. League of Their Own kind of catches him on. And then you get within a year or two Philadelphia Forrest Gump and he is the biggest fucking and, and movie star. And the Oscars. Yeah. And the Oscars. And, and he is still, you know, pumping shit out to this day. And I got to say, you can't not love I, – I don't think – I don't think you cannot not like Tom Hanks. Yeah. Right? And especially this era of Tom Hanks, I feel like he's so – he's a lot sillier than – I. you know, I love a lot of his other more serious movies. But he's kind of almost like a different – I guess because he's younger. But this and Big, he, he's, he just has almost like a different personality. Yeah. It, it, well, he's 65, I think, now. Let's so. not forget, he was the alcoholic uncle in Family Ties. That's right. <laughs> That was his dramatic, you know, he showed his range in that episode. He did. I mean, we've seen him, you know, was he in anything serious before, like, Philadelphia and all that? I can't remember if he ever did, like, any of those type movies. Uh, Not the War of the... What was it? The Bonfire of the Vanities, but that was more... It was a Tom... Based on the Tom Wolf book, it was more silly, but... Yeah. You know. Yeah, and that was a huge bomb, too, which was. was in the same era 
of like Hanks kind of like, you know, again, big wasn't the one big should have been the one that stratosphered him. And it didn't yeah. uh, because he made some choices like, and unfortunately, whether you like it or not, the burbs, I think is, is one of those choices because it's a cult movie. But I was really surprised to see that it made it made money. We'll talk about that in a minute. I, I would have thought this was a box office bomb. This was not. Bring up one thing, though. You, you say it should have stratosphered him, and it didn't. It did in one sense. The, fo- the follow-up movies to Big didn't make as much money as they should have. But my grandparents went to see The Burbs when it came out, strictly because he was in it. Okay. So I remember uh-huh. my grandmother, because I asked, like, how, you know, what would you think of it? She goes, it was silly. Yeah, that was the review. It was silly. Yeah, it was if, silly. Yeah, if you're like thinking Tom Hanks, you're going in like straightforward movie, like oh, just classic comedy. It's like no, then this is not it, and that's yeah. why I like it. It covers like it's it's very absurd. This is definitely a um, unique movie because it's it just you know like a lot of times when you're thinking about movies, you think okay, this has the same plot as that. There's nothing with a plot like The Burbs. It's, yeah. it's it's an odd one. Uh, the Burbs came out on February 17th of 1989. It was originally supposed to come out Christmas season of 1988, but got pushed back. Directed by Joe Dante, who made uh, Gremlins, and <laughs> I'm going to get yelled at here, maybe even by Sean, but maybe one of the most overrated horror movies of all time, The Howling. Uh, yeah, like... <laughs> Yeah, Rob might have a word or two with you. I've heard, favorite, um, uh, you know... First of all, Werewolf. American Were- Werewolf in London is far superior and second of all, I watched The Howling for the first time ever, beginning to end, this year or last year during COVID. And it has got some great effects. It does. And there are some good scenes in it. Yeah. But, man, I, I don't get it. Takes it takes a while to get there, though. <laughs> takes a real long time to get there. Uh, and Joe Dante, you know, he's known for, you know, like I said, Gremlins and... and uh, Inner Space. Inner Space. And Which is a great movie. It is a great movie. He's done, he's done a lot of, like, these kind of, like, little weirdo things. This was not even originally a Joe Dante project. This was something that got brought to him because um, it it kind of feels like something he would do, and it kind of feels like maybe something like like that he wouldn't do. Um, and I always thought this was just from not knowing much about it was like something he championed along. This was a script that he got and just said, "Okay, I'm going to add my sensibilities to it." Uh, written by a guy named Dana Olson, uh, he went on to write uh, George of the Jungle. Watch out for that tree. And uh, <laughs> Inspector Gadget. So uh, Quite the resume. Yeah, he's got quite the resume. It was filmed uh, between May 19th and July 3rd of 1988 on the uh, Colonial Street backlot in Universal Studios. If you have ever seen any movie ever uh, or TV show, it was filmed there. Desperate Housewives. Uh, there's a ton of stuff. They talk a lot about it in the like, kind of trivia of this thing. And it's true. There are not a lot of movies that take place in one locale. Mm. Like, like straight up one locale. Like Lifeboat or something along those lines. Or like a movie we're going to talk about in a little while, which is very <laughs> weird, uh, on Sean's episode, Rope, the Alfred Hitchcock film. But this whole, now this movie doesn't take place in one house or anything, but it takes place entirely on one street. We never get past that yeah. street. So it, it, it's a very kind of claustrophobic uh, feel. Let's talk about the cast. You ready? Sure. Ray Peterson, played by Tom Hanks. We just talked about Tom Hanks. I'm done. <laughs> uh, Carrie Fisher plays his wife, Carol Peterson. You may know her because she's Princess fucking Leia. That's what I wrote here. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Rick Dukeman, uh, Art Weingartner, uh, he's very familiar. He's like a character actor, but a couple of things he's been in, uh, Gremlins 2 and The Last Boy Scout, which I just rewatched a few months ago. He's the guy who their car falls into his pool. If you've ever seen that before. Yeah. I yeah. think he's also in Groundhog's Day. He has like very small appearance there. Yeah. He's, he's in a ton of stuff. He died in 2015. Encino Man. Let's not leave that out. I've oh. never seen Encino oh, Man. Oh, oh. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Another yeah. PMI. We got to keep it going. Uh, no. We'll, I, we'll, we'll review it anyway. We'll review it anyway. Uh, Bruce Dern. Uh, he plays uh, Mark Rumsfeld, uh, who's like a very militaristic guy. Uh, we had a podcast, me and Lloyd, over on the Forgotten Entertainment uh, channel. Uh, you can check them out, ForgottenEntertainment.com, called On the QT. Sean, you were on the Kill Bill Volume yes. 1 episode. Yep. Uh, Bruce Stern did a couple of uh, Tarantino films amongst everything else he's ever done. He was in The uh, Hateful Eight, and he was in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Uh, so, And his daughter, Laura Dern, was in uh, Jurassic Park. He was also in Hitchcock's last movie. Was he really? I think was Family Plot in the 70s. Yeah, he was he was in that movie. Okay. I was researching and I noticed I'm like, wow, here's a connection between Here's a connection. The two. Yeah. Yeah, cuz he's got to be probably in his 50s in yeah, this movie, I would yeah, say. Yeah, easily. Uh, let's see. Corey Feldman. We all love Corey Feldman, right? Yeah. Uh, he plays Ricky Butler. Uh, you know him from The Lost Boys, The Goonies, and for that period of time when you guys remember when Corey Feldman was Michael Jackson? Oh, like yeah. For, yeah. for a good 10 years. Dream oh, that was my childhood. Yeah. yeah, when he was Michael Jackson. He was Michael Jackson, yeah. Interesting uh interesting trivia about this movie I was reading is that this was during the heyday of uh, Feldman and Michael Jackson's friendship. 
Michael Jackson never visited the set, but Bubbles the Chimp was allowed to stay in Corey Haim's trailer until he apparently spread his feces all over it, and Joe Dante had to tell Corey Feldman that Bubbles the Chimp is not allowed back on the set. Dark day. Dark day in the history of the burbs, everybody. Yeah, I mean, better than Corey Feldman, you know, smearing his feces everywhere. (laughs) Yeah, especially at this time, because I think this is right around the time uh, when Feldman was getting into drugs. It and, could have happened. And they said uh, Carrie Fisher and uh, and Wendy Schall, who played Bruce Dern's wife, um, had to kind of like help him out a lot, like, because he was getting pretty bad. This is, do you remember when he swallowed the bags of heroin or something and got caught at the airport? Yeah. Yeah. This is right around the same time. Right. Right. Uh, let's see who else. Henry Gibson plays Warner Klopek or Klopek. Klopek. He is the, uh, the doctor, the new neighbor next the door. The doctor. The doctor. You might know him as uh, an Illinois Nazi from the Blues Brothers. And he is also, he's one of Joe Dante's guys. He's in a bunch of stuff. He's in, uh, he's in inter- inter- space. You yep. mentioned he's the grocery store manager and he's been, a, oh, one of my favorites. He was in, um, Wedding Crashers. He is the priest. Really? He's the priest hmm. who Vince Vaughn has the silent conversation with where Vince Vaughn says everything and the priest never says a word. And uh, he, 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 they both drink the big drink and everything. Um, Courtney Gaines, who you mentioned, was at CT Horror Fest. CT Horror Fest coming back next year for two days. Yes. Sean, are you very excited Friday, about that? I, I am. We're, we're, we're finally doing it. We're finally expanding. It was great this Friday, year. Friday, Saturday. It, it was. It was awesome. Had an awesome it was time. Awesome. Yeah. The facility had some issues this year. But I, as I want to point out to anybody who listens who went, and most of them were very positive, that's beyond you. Mm-hmm. But Rob and Christine have talked to the people that are in charge. And those are not going to happen again. No, they they're taking care of it. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Uh, two days, Friday, Saturday. Who did you? Who did you? Um, you, did I, I know, sit with? You're like the Wrangler, right? Like you, you have to, you you get to walk people around. Were you Skeet uh, Ulrich's Wrangler this I year? Had, no, no, I was uh, Jake the Snake Roberts. Oh wow, that's, that's right. a good one. For five, four hours actually, they had to leave a little bit early, but yeah, just to hear him comment on every woman who walked by. That was great. <laughs> Talk about the '80s. Was he, was he, did I hear the, I think you even kind of uh, solidified this for me that day, but um, on oxygen, but smoking? He would take smoke breaks. (laughs) Yeah. But he would leave his oxygen, yeah, at the table. Okay. So so safety first for Jake Snake. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, (laughs) thanks, Mr. DBT. (laughs) Uh, Courtney Gaines, who was at Horror Fest like three years ago, uh, plays Hans Klopek. Was it Klopek or Klopek? Klopek. Klopek. Uh, He was obviously in Memphis Bell. Uh, which is a, a great movie. And Children of the Corn, Malachi, right? He's Malachi. And Can't Buy Me Love. Can't Buy Me Love. That's a great one. What, what is the line in that one? Yes. You should shit, shit my house. house. You, you know go. what? It, to go back to that horror fest, I met up with him afterwards. And I was like, can I get a picture? He's like, yeah, sure. I was like, can you please say you threw shit on my house? He goes, no. No. Disgusted look in his face. No. Wow. And I just walked. You know, we got the picture. I walked away. I, was, I, was like, <laughs> I have I just, a feeling I he gets that it. a lot. You probably, but don't be a dick about it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it made you money. Like, why wouldn't you yeah, exactly. be happy about it? Yeah. You're on the fucking the contour because of yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, because you know? uh, I don't know what you're known for uh, yeah. in the more recent Well, he was times. in Colors, too. Let's not forget this. Oh, wow. That's right. He's he one of the, the, the gang members. The essays, yeah. Was he? Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Wow. Yep. In this movie, he plays the, the, so we'll get into the plot in a second, but he plays the neighbor's, like, I don't want to say son because it's three guys. Nephew. He's the nephew. Nephew, right? Yeah. Is he supposed to look like a Cro Magnon man? I think so. Yeah, like, yeah, is there, is like there brow work yeah. or something? Because like he genuinely, if he's oh, not sure. Okay, yeah, his, so he's got eyebrows. something on. His eyebrows too are like three eyebrows, times the yeah. size. Okay, teeth, the teeth. There's something As I'm on watching, there. I'm like, he if he's got to be wearing prosthetics. There's no way they did this with like no, he doesn't him just like you know jutting his jaw out. He literally does look like a Cro Magnon. This <laughs> eighteen million dollar budget. Uh, U.S. and Canada gross, 37 mil. Uh, worldwide, 49. I would never have thought the Burbs made money. I would have thought uh, 18 million budget, $6 million intake. I, I, I always thought this was like a failed movie in the theaters that became a cult classic. Yeah, I don't, I don't even remember it being in the theaters. Again, my grandparents went to see it. Yeah. Just because Tom Hanks was in it. So people were, yeah. people. This, I, this was m- Joe versus Volcano after? Or after. Was, after. So after. that bore the brunt of... I'm okay, almost definite this is his first movie after Big. So that might be one of the reasons. Yeah. The that residual, might be one of the reasons. The residual heat, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, Sal, why don't you give us the bumper sticker of what The Burbs is all about? Uh, basically it's a neighborhood in the burbs, obviously, but it's like kind of where the neighbors are all up in each other's business. And there's, uh, this one, that one neighbor that, you know, everyone has and everyone knows nothing about and they're kind of mysterious and the neighborhood just kind of 
gets wrapped up in this drama thinking they're doing some nefarious things and uh, silliness ensues. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. Ray Peterson is a uh, is a is kind of a wor- working man dad. He's on his week vacation. Yeah. And his wife is trying to get him to go to the lake. He doesn't want to go to the lake. He just wants to relax, but he doesn't end up relaxing. No. He ends up spending the entire week uh, slowly becoming obsessed and enrolled in his other neighbors, okay, and and all that. So that's Ray. Ray is, is the lead character. Sean, why don't you explain to everybody out there who Art Weingartner is? Art is um, somebody that uh, – now, you never see his, his, his wife. No. Nope. Right? She's gone the whole movie. Um, he's somebody that always needs to be in everyone else's business and feels it falls upon him to correct things amiss in the neighborhood. Like he's, he's a one man neighborhood watch basically. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. And then he recruits gullible people like, you know, Tom Hanks to help him out. Have you ever seen anybody eat a breakfast like that? (laughs) (laughs) Well, with the ribs and everything. (laughs) So he goes over to Ray's house, Tom Hanks's house. And while they're, while him and his wife and kid are eating breakfast. He starts to just eat like it's one of those things like you see in the movie all the time. You're going to finish this. And he starts to kind of compact all of their breakfasts together and eat it. Then he gets up and he goes to the fridge and he pulls out last night's leftovers, which are ribs, apparently. <laughs> and he starts eating the ribs and he's pouring maple. He's got new, a new maple syrup out and he's pouring that. And then, like, did you notice what he asked after the breakfast scene when they're kind of walking across the street? Did you notice what he asked Ray if he wanted to do? Did he say if he wanted to get breakfast? He said, do you want to go into town to the deli and get a couple of those beef oh. sandwiches? Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. And it's like, wow, this guy, I mean, he's, 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 he's obviously, eating a lot in this he's movie. eating a lot in this movie. Yeah. Okay. All right, Sal, who is, who's uh, Mark Rumsfeld? Oh, Mr. Rumsfeld. He's like the kooky neighbor military, you know, ex-military guy who's still, you know, sort of reliving it day to day. How does he start every day? He sort of puts up the flag, raises the flag, salutes it. He's got like, you know, he's OCD about his grass and everything. And he's got the trophy wife. Yeah. Uh, no tan lines today, Mrs. Rumsfeld. <laughs> I don't know how that would go over if, uh, you know, like, like, like Corey Feldman's character, Ricky, uh, Ricky Butler, who is kind of like the audience in this thing. He's, he's just the neighborhood kid. You never see his parents. He's uh, supposedly painting the, the, the deck, I guess, but yeah, you never really gets too far in it. And across the street, you're talking about the perfect uh, lawn. We've got who's who's that uh, that character's name? Walter. Walter. Yeah. Walter. M- Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson, essentially, right? He was uh, the second Mr. Wilson. That was. Was he? yeah. Wow. I okay. I didn't know it was him, but like he was super familiar. Yeah, he has that look of. How like, the fuck? <laughs> he was that old in 1955. Yeah. Wow. He's probably middle aged. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's like forty. Yeah. Yeah, middle, 40 in 1955 was a hard 40. Yeah, hard 40. Yeah, you yeah. lived through the war, multiple wars. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, so he's he's got this pristine house. He's got his little doggy that runs around. Which, that dog, did you know that dog is the same dog from Sounds of the Lambs? Yes, it is. Okay. Que- Queenie is precious. Yeah. Hmm. Queenie the dog from the Burbs is precious two years later. If you don't know who precious is, uh, check out the Sounds of the Lambs and... Um, you better put her in the bucket, you fucking bitch. <laughs> you better not hurt her, you fucking bitch. <laughs> so this is kind of the group we're, we're, we're talking about here. Next door to Ray Peterson's house. And this is an idyllic road, right? Very nice, very beautiful. Huge houses. Huge houses. Everybody, yeah, everybody, way, way more house than they probably can handle. But right next to Ray's house is essentially what looks like the fucking Munster's house. Now, the first question I had is, is was that house always fucking shitty like that when the Naps, who were the previous neighbors they keep talking about, lived there? Like, like was there not a lawn? Because there's no lawn. No. It's just straight up fucking like gray soot for for the ground. The, the, the house looks like it's been drained of all color. And the first scene that Ray kind of at night, he hears something. Sean, what do we keep hearing over and over again in this movie? Oh, God. It's uh, somebody splitting the atom in the, the yeah. basement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's this horrible, uh, you know, surge of electricity, and and you and can light. see the lights from the yeah. basement, you know. And this is not the kind of neighborhood this shit this shit happens. I want to point out that you kind of said something before. Dana Olson, the writer of this, based this on his his own life as a kid, and stories he heard people say that, like you know, and if you think about it, it's kind of true. Everybody's lived in a neighborhood where there's that house that you're like, yeah, I never saw those fucking people. You know, they never cut their lawn. Like I've never seen anybody go in or out. Right? You guys have experienced that, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. My my parents' neighbor 
he, yeah, when I was growing up, he, he had uh, stepkids who I was friends with and everything. But he we used to shoot at our cat. He, it was later on found out, he had like three wives. And it was later found out when his last wife was divorcing him that she found like an area where he was like hiding all these documents. And he had like two more wives he never told anyone about. And she was like, what is this? Wait, so wait, three plus two? Yeah. Five. Yeah. Wow. He was like an older guy, like an orthodontist, you know, someone almost to the doctor. Well, honestly, you know that the truth with that, though, is that like, like orthodontists get more pussy than any other <laughs> like like kind of doctor there is out there. I just want to point that out just so everybody Bunch knows. Bunch are always bringing their kids. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 But it, it was just this whole crazy story about they found out all this information about him afterwards. He was like hiding and one day when he was like not around and she was like digging through his shit. How is that not a movie? This might be part of the burbs. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll start writing that script. I, I, I want to I see the rest of that. Ray isn't really a busybody, but he's like prone to getting like caught up in this bullshit. Uh, Art's a busybody, and Rumsfeld is kind of just like uh, he's kind of like you know like the, he's like the military guy who wants to find out what's going on for truth and justice, right? And uh, Ricky, the uh, the Corey Feldman character, is he just watches. He never really gets truly too involved. He loves the chaos. He wants it to continue. What does he keep saying in this, Al? He, he said it twice in the movie, right? At the beginning he's, and then at the end, he breaks the fourth he's wall. He's like, I love this neighborhood. Right. I love I love this street, I think it was, right? Yeah. Or I love this neighborhood, was. whatever it was. Um, yeah, he's basically like a popcorn dot gif. Walter, the neighbor who has the dog that shits on Rumsfeld's lawn, suddenly apparently goes missing, right? Uh, so now that's like the next step. What happened to him? We've got to figure it out. So they go over to his house. They go inside. They kind of start checking around. Um, and he's just, he's totally gone, right? Um, in the meantime, they also very close to this see the, uh, the son, or I'm sorry, the nephew of the, we never see, we never see who lives in the house. You occasionally will get the little curtain, right? But it's like Jaws. We don't see who lives in this house like halfway through the fucking movie. Yeah. Okay. Um, we, we do get a glance at Courtney Gaines's character, Hans, the, the young guy. Dressed very peculiarly, by the way. Now it came out to stretch. You know, yeah. Like more, it, nice morning stretch on the front porch. It does a morning stretch on the yeah. front porch. And, uh, and then later on in the movie, after Walter's missing, we see him drive the car out of the garage. <laughs> To the end of the driveway. And then he puts a bag in the in the garbage can. And then Sal, how does he get the bag in the in the garbage can? Oh, he just mashes it in with like a you know, oops, garden garden utensil. He's, yeah. You know you you don't drive your garbage out in your in your trunk of your car? I never have. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I never have. It, it is a rough fifteen feet from the garage. To the <laughs> it is. Curb, it, it, so. it, it was probably twenty. Let's be fair. <laughs> twenty yeah. feet, yeah. Twenty feet. Um, and uh, and Ray and and Art see this, which adds to the kind of like what's going on here, right? What's in happening? Broad daylight. In broad daylight. Uh, well, no, that was at night. That was at night. That oh, happened in, at night. in the rain. Too. In the rain. Gotcha. Yeah, they're, they're spying on this guy. Yeah. Uh, Ray actually walks away from. Did you did you notice that it seemed to me that Ray and his wife, played again by Carrie Fisher, aka Princess Leia, uh, were like somehow playing along with Jeopardy with notepads? Did you guys notice that? Yeah. Okay. Have you ever done that? I mean, everybody plays wrong with Jeopardy when they watch Jeopardy. It's always like you, you always got to be the smartest person in the room, right? Like, who is this? Boom. Who is that? But it seemed like they were like actually marking their answers down. Yeah. yeah well, actually, uh, one of the things about this movie is uh, it, it, like I guess there was like a writer's strike then. And there was this whole thing where they couldn't have the writer on the on set. So there was a lot of improving on on the set. Where some of those scenes, and I guess the Jeopardy scene is one of them, where they were just basically improving that whole scene. That like at the end, the stretcher scene with Tom Hanks. I did read that. There's and a couple other that scenes. stretcher scene. I, I laughed out loud at. Yeah, when he grabs it, throws it's, himself on it, and goes into the into the. Yeah, and, and then I read afterwards that was like all Tom Hanks' idea. That that was fucking golden. Yeah, so I don't know if that's why some of this just weird stuff is in there that they're like, hey, just go do your thing. What what a good place to have, especially Carrie Fisher. Yeah. Because she was known to be a script doctor, mm -hmm. so maybe she couldn't write stuff. But I mean, she's obviously got ideas going off all the time. Yeah, she's kind of like I. It's weird because this is like six years after Return of the Jedi. Yeah, and uh, this is before she kind of really became. Well, she wasn't as much of a mess either at this point that she kind of ended up becoming. But like, she wasn't really known yet for being like like a script writer and everything. 
it just kind of seems like she's almost wasted in this movie. Do you feel that way? Like yeah, it's weird because too, at the end of the movie, she shows up with a haircut and it's yeah. like, it's part of the, they comment on it, but I'm like, was that like an inside joke? Cause she was like, oh, started filming another movie or something. I wondered that too. She just is random. Just shows up at the end of the movie, different hair, it's a little bit shorter, even though she and was supposedly at the lake. Or like, whatever. Oh, I, like, I like your haircut. So the, oh, like, the craziest like, part that you guys mentioned that about is that, so he does say that to her. I discern no difference. It looked like the same haircut. Slightly shorter. It was shorter. Okay. Yeah. I, when he said that, I'm like, Tom Hanks, you're you're that guy every woman wants because, you know, like the guy who goes, oh, your hair looks lovely. You had it done today. Like, I get it. Like, if, if she had, like, long flowing hair and she comes up and it's up to her shoulders, you go, get your hair done. You look beautiful. Her hair literally went from, like, kind of like, you know, shortish hair to possibly a little bit less shortish hair. I, I didn't see it. And so when he says that to her, I'm like, I don't, I don't think so, Tom Hanks, but... You guys both noticed it too. Yeah, no, I noticed it only because I was like, and I I knew it was in the movie because of the line, but I did notice. I was like, yeah, her hair definitely looks shorter now. Why did they do that? Yeah, it, it's an odd remark. Yeah, I think you're right, Sal. Like, I only think they, just, they were filming and they just kept it in. Yeah, only because they were like at the at the lake, and yeah. it's like you're getting your hair styled at the lake. I don't think so. No, it's kind of no. like when Mark Hamill screamed, you know, at the end of. Uh, uh, New Hope, whatever you want to call it for Star Wars movie. Oh. Um, he calls her Carrie instead of <laughs> yeah. That's debatable what he said. Sounds like he says Carrie. Oh yeah, he said Carrie. You know, but I think they're just fuck it, leave it in, leave it in. Fuck it. This movie, nobody's gonna see this fucking piece yeah, of shit. <laughs> Who's this George Lucas guy? <laughs> this and he's crazy. Stupid movie with this golden robot. Nobody's gonna see this stupid piece of shit. <laughs> I'm going home. <laughs> you guys, I want to talk about tone for a minute while we're talking about this movie. What tone do you think they were going for in this movie, Sean? Like. Because this, I'll be honest with you. So I'd never seen the Burbs before. I knew nothing about the Burbs other than Tom Hanks is on vacation and he lives in the suburbs. Yeah. I had no clue it was about evil neighbors. I had no clue that there was this whole sub level of like this neighborhood, these neighborhood guys and girls coming and women coming together and trying to solve a mission. I had no clue. Yeah. It's definitely dark satire, but. I'll be honest, it plays like a horror movie, like a, a horror movie that's making fun of itself. I mean, especially the end. The end is extremely dark. Oh, yeah. Oh, so yeah. It, it is. It, it achieves that level to me. It's a it's a dark, satirical, self-parodying horror movie. Sal, so what do you think? Yeah, I, I, I've heard it described as like a dark comedy, but it also has it, it has like some like genre things in there. Like you have like like in in sort of relates to the soundtrack you have a hint of western where they have like the bells in the soundtrack and then you have the military stuff with like the whistling and then you have the the dream of like the horror where you know he's putting him on the him on the grill and so it kind of covers all these different styles which is kind of cool i think from watching this i think one of the most interesting parts of doing this for this show is that it's it, it is wholly unique right like there's so many movies that like kind of I think copy other movie styles or the Burbs is not like that. Like like you said, is it a dark? Is it supposed to be? What what do you think? Okay, here here's a here's a, probably what I'm trying to get out and say. So now thirty plus years later, fuck yeah, thirty five years later, essentially, we're calling it like a dark comedy. We're calling it like almost like a pseudo horror movie, right? But what do you think they sold this as? Like, what do you think? I would love to see the trailer. Do you think this was sold as a <laughs> funny comedy with, a, with your neighbors? You know, that kind of thing. One thing I remember specifically from the trailer. I didn't go back and watch any trailers on YouTube or anything. But when I was, you know, a kid at that time, seeing it on TV, that part with the femur bone. And <laughs> Tom Hanks' reaction, which is hysterical, by the way. Yeah. Where he yeah. just looks up and goes, ah. Like his face. And then he keeps doing it. Well, and they, yeah, right. They, they, both, the they both scream. They and both, the zoom, but art yeah. stops. And then Tom Hanks is still he's, doing it. Like, <laughs> Yeah, the Zoom even stops, too. And he's still going. He's still and, going. Yeah. And, and he's like, this is, you know, this is Walter. I remember that in the commercial. And it's like, all right, well, that really is like a human bone. <laughs> right. <laughs> they're laughing. So I don't get it. <laughs> like, what? What are they going for here? I think they were just selling it as like a, a silly. You know, I silly think there comedy. is like a little thrill element that they're selling. They're trying to sell it as because it's kind of, you know, they do try and keep it a little. I'd say, I don't want to say scary because, you know, it's not scary. But if you're, you know, your grandparents or something going to see it, you're kind of like, oh, I don't know. Like, uh, this is a little scarier than I thought. Yeah, well, I mean, it, in the end, it's about like a, a serial killing family that does live next door. I mean, that's major. We always talk about spoilers at the beginning, so you knew it was coming. At one point, they kind of get you to think these are just weird people, 
And then at one point you start to think that like, holy fuck, like Ray and these guys have really fucked these people's lives over. Um, and then you kind of learn the truth. So they think that Walter's been murdered. Then they've seen a body put into the uh, into the garbage. By the way, we get the, another two great cameos from Joe Dante guys, Dick Miller uh, and Robert Picardo, who uh, who have both been in a million things for, that he's done, are the garbage men. Let me ask you right off the bat, Sal, you're a garbage man, and a couple of locals jump into your truck and make that kind of fucking mess. You putting up with that shit? You gonna make them? Uh, oh no, hey, they're they're getting either thrown in in there and the compactor turned on, or yeah, you're just like I, they were very tolerant, and I, especially arguing about the Supreme Court uh, decision and they, they're, they're making me so fucking mad. Sean, were they making you mad? Them like making that fucking it didn't mess? make me mad. I think they knew better with that street. To just leave it alone. Yeah. It seems like it's not the first They'll time. They'll be targeted it's next. Yeah. yeah. My favorite part, too, is they just leave the garbage and, it, like, through the whole movie, they're driving over it. Like, That's everyone's like, driving over it, like, not even swerving around it. It's a great running gag, which I didn't notice. If I missed it, I didn't notice till the very end when all the action's happening. But multiple cars just dr- like drive over the garbage. I'm like, hey, that's like days ago. Yeah. That was days ago. We get the scene where they finally decide, you know, they, earlier in the movie, they decide to go over and check the house out, and they only meet Hans at that point. A uh, great little visual joke is the address is 669, <laughs> and when they go over and knock on the door, the last, the nine drops over, uh, and now it's 666. The women who, you know, basically are, are saying, you know, you guys are not using your brains, we're going to bake some brownies, and let's go over and just be good fucking neighbors, because we're tired of this shit. It's getting old. So Carrie Fisher and uh, and and uh, as as Ray's wife, Carol, and uh, and Mark Rumsfeld's wife, they put on their nicest clothes and they get the guys and they all go over. And we have this incredibly odd meeting to begin with where we slowly, we meet Hans again. And then we meet what, who's the, who's the other, the other uncle? What's his name? Ruben. Ruben Rubes, right? They call yeah. him Rubes. <laughs> Played by an actor named Brother Theodore. Yeah, that was weird. Yeah. I saw that in the credits. Yeah. I didn't look into it or write it down. I, I, I should have. Yeah, I I looked that up at one point, and he has another name, but it doesn't say like what like how come like I don't like it doesn't sound like brother is his name. It's about that he goes by that, but I couldn't find the story about he it. He looks to me like what if Danny DeVito and Robert Blake had a fucking baby? <laughs> totally, <laughs> yeah, you nailed it. Right? I kept looking at him, going, "Is that Robert Blake?" But then I'm like, Robert Blake is small, but not that fucking small. But Danny DeVito's that small. So maybe if Robert Blake and Dan DeVito had a butt baby, it would be Brother Theodore. And the grumpiness, my God. Oh, he's so fucking angry. So perfect. So he, he he comes out, and he's not having any other shit. They kind of reference the doctor. Say, doctor, my brother's a doctor, right? So now we're learning that, the, uh, not Theodore, fucking Reuben and the doctor are brothers, and fucking Hans is someone's kid. I don't know <laughs> if we ever even talk about that. No. Um, there's some good, like, little visual jokes. And another thing that was improvised, I read, uh, was when Bruce Dern rips the wallpaper off the wall. <laughs> that was just improvised. He just did that and they left it in. Um, and then also the other part that, uh, that was improvised was when Bruce Dern keeps on turning the painting upside down. Oh. And Ruben turns it back the other way. And you could tell it is right the way it's supposed to be. But we get what I think is one of the funniest, like, physical com- comedy moments in this whole movie in this scene is when Hans goes to get refreshments for everybody. Because he brings the old traditional American staple. Sean, what does he bring out? Uh, what, what we got? Sardines and uh, pretzels? or Sardines know? and pretzels. Yeah, I mean, come on. Like, you have folks Can't over. USA. I was going to bring that tonight. Right. You were going to bring it tonight. You have folks over, Sean, over at the house uh, down there in Monroe. Big hit. You're going to have people over. You go, what are we going to have? Sardines and pretzels. Yes. Right? That's what yeah. we're going to do. And one of the funniest comic moments is uh, they bring out the sardines and pretzels, which, first of all, Okay, let's go around on this one. Sean, you ever eat a sardine before? Not uh, willingly or that I knew of. Okay. Sal? Uh, I don't think so. Me neither. I know people, my father-in-law, maybe it's a generational thing. My father-in-law, a guy I used to work with who's also a little bit older, love him. Like, this is the snack of all snacks. <laughs> They're fucking rotten ass little fish covered in oil and tomato sauce it's and all salt. this shit. It's the people salt. I think is, my dad likes them, I think. Ugh. Fucking uh, Carol can like kind of through through physical language, you know, like like eyeballs tells Ray, you, you can't fucking say no. Right. So he fucking he eats. And the first thing did you notice, the first thing is his fingers. He's just got yeah. like fucking sardine shit all over his fingers. Yeah. 
But how, what does he do and how does he eat the fucking sardine? Which I, th- I thought this I thought this scene was fucking great. Does he try and eat the whole thing in one bite? He puts it on top of a fucking oh, yeah. a pretzel. Yeah. Right. Yep. And then he just like he kind of well, How do you do it, John? Come on. I I guess if I <laughs> you had don't have to them separate, I mean, come on. I guess if I had to, I would put them together. Um because well, the the wives only took a pretzel, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah, they didn't go near this. I thing. would take a pretzel. I would be polite and say, "Oh, pretzel, great. I don't eat fish. I'm it's against my religion." Um but Ray just goes for the whole fucking thing. And as he's chewing it, you hear the bones crunching. My favorite part is even when he's touching the pretzel, the sound effects on the sardine are so disgusting. Like, it, yeah. the sound effects, there's lots of scenes where there's just, like, in that same scene, you know, there's, like, flies buzzing around Hans. And there's a couple of times where they do, like, weird sound effects. And it, it's, like, really, you could tell that someone really is, like, oh, let's really that, do this That up. scene is an ASMR nightmare. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Especially him eating the yeah. pretzel oh, the sardine. it's gross. My God. It's <laughs> gross. I turned it off. You mentioned uh, you mentioned the the sound effects. I did not go back and rewatch it to hear it, but apparently, when um, the scene later on in the movie where Art falls through the the shed, it's a, a bowling strike. Yeah, is what the sound effect is, and I didn't notice that. But there's just a couple weird things like that, which made me think, like, okay, when they were making this movie, it had to be comedy in mind because in the beginning, I don't know if you noticed it. But in, like, the f- first scene with, like, the sort of theme song, there's, like, a synthesizer dog that's like, yow, 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 yow. no, like, I didn't it's, notice. It's, it's, like, played, like, on a keyboard, but it's, like, part of the song. And it's, I'm, I've definitely noticed it before, but it really stood out to me this time. And I'm like, oh, that's a choice. It's, it's hilarious, but it's, like, who is, like, I got a great idea. Dog samples, right? Yeah. This is also, uh, I want to point this out, this is also one of those rare movies, you get them once in a while, Universal Pictures, where the globe plays into the movie. Yeah. Waterworld does that. Mm-hmm. And there are more than just those two. But the movie starts with the Universal Globe, and then the actual Universal logo disappears, and then we end up going to where this is, which, by the way, uh, I read uh, from from where they show it's supposed to be Des Moines, Iowa. Um, I don't know how true that is. But <laughs> yeah, because there's a lot of palm trees and backyards in Des Moines. <laughs> where there, yeah, I didn't even notice that. Tom yeah. Hanks is, yeah. If you, do, if you do look at it, it does go into the Midwest United States, so. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's palm trees and hill and desert hills in the back. <laughs> yeah, in his backyard, <laughs> I, I think there's some palm trees. There, Tom Hanks' backyard, he's laying down. I noticed a couple palm trees back there. All right, well, the the lovely tropical paradise of Des Moines, <laughs> Iowa. Des Moines. So these guys, um, they go over and they leave the house. And when they leave the house, everybody feels a little bit better. You know, the doctor comes upstairs and he just says, hey, I've been working uh, downstairs. And uh, what, what did, did he say what he was working on? His painting. His painting, right. He's a painter. He's uh, an artist, yeah. He's an artist. Everybody feels a little bit better, but then fucking Ray pulls out. What does he find? The, the, Walter's hairpiece. He finds the hairpiece that earlier in the movie they found when Walter went missing that he put back in the mail slot. And he says he finds it jammed in a, in a closet amongst a bunch of magazines. That's important later on. So these guys eventually get to the point where they're like, this guy killed him. We got to figure it out. And we get towards the end of the movie where they decide... We're going to band together. We're going to break into this fucking guy's house. They know that they're going away for the next day because they said they have to go to some kind of like uh, consortium or some shit. We'd love right? to know where they went, by the way. <laughs> yeah, really. They <laughs> were all together. All, all yeah. together, all day long. <laughs> and they they take that to uh, to go in. Now, I th- I would think Rumsfeld would be the guy to go in, right? He's a Green Beret commando, yeah. Navy SEAL, fucking whatever he is, Zero Dark Thirty. But he's the guy who sits up on the roof. and He's, uh, he's and, an eagle eye. He keeps yeah. the eagle eye. Art says, oh, I know electricity. I'm going to get up on this fucking pole. I'm going to shut their electricity off. He electrocutes himself, falls through the fucking, through the shed, and Ray goes in. They go in. And well, they, he, but he does his job. He does do his job. Which yeah. is amazing. Because yeah. he kind of seems like the guy, he's, you know, he's always like egging everyone else on. Yeah. And- yeah. He's smoking when he gets up. Like, he's actually all fucked up. Uh, they get down. They get into the house. And they end up in the basement. And, Sean, what do they find in the fucking basement? They find... Um- and in, I guess an industrial size furnace, one that definitely should not be in a in a residence. No, a, a cre- essentially a crematorium. A crematorium. Yeah. yeah, and and you know Ray gets like, oh, there's this new piping, and this is you know they start doing their thing, and then they see like a bank of batteries, which it takes to fucking. And now we know they hit the power button, and this thing fucking goes off. It blasts a fucking a flame ball out of the front of it, and from the outside we see this what we've been seeing through the whole movie. We hear the fucking the power surge. And we see everything light up. And they decide, Ray decides right then and there that he's going to start what? He's going to, for some reason, he's going to dig in the 
basement floor, the dirt, because he thinks they buried the bodies there, which doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. I think he says that the the floor dirt is softer. Yeah. Yeah. Than... He's like, oh, they they burned the bodies and then buried it down there, which I feel like, uh, I don't know if that makes the most sense. But meanwhile, out in the street, Ricky and his friends, who I I just want to call them the 80s teenagers. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah. Um, which, by the way, one of them, did you notice who one of them was? Um, do you guys know who Nikki Cat is? Oh yeah, Nikki oh, that Cat. Was him? Nikki Cat uh, had the big hair. Wow! And he goes, we're going to McD's, man. Yeah, that I got was, pizza dude coming. Yeah, yeah, we got pizza dude coming. Yeah, that was Nikki Cat. Wow. So yeah, so he's got all of his his guys there, and they're like you know like most like eighteen year old teenagers back in like nineteen eighty eight. You would be watching the neighborhood, you know, to see what sure. happens. You know, because that's, yeah. that's that's what that's, that's what where you the did. party's at. Yeah. You know, that's where the party's at. You weren't you weren't fucking you know doing coke or fucking your girlfriend or anything. You're you're watching. So he's trying to impress house. his girlfriend with all the action in this neighborhood, which yeah. it does kind of deliver in the end. Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, <laughs> let's be honest. I mean, if you're gonna say to somebody, "Hey, let's stare at someone's house for four or five hours," yeah. I'm gonna get a hundred pizzas. By the way, do you notice how many fucking pizzas? <laughs> yeah. When that thing busts open, there's at least a hundred. There's out. there's seven kids there. <laughs> Right, that's one of my favorite lines too in the movie because it's kind of like it sounds like it's like overdubbed. There's like it's the pizza dude, yeah. Like, dude, yeah, yeah. It's just uh, Corey Feldman in this movie. You know, he, he just he delivers. He, he does deliver. He, he's just got so many classic lines, just being like th- such a character of himself in it. But it plays so well. But you know what? He did not paint the fucking deck. <laughs> he yeah. never did. He never painted it. He, he had a week it, to do it. He and not just that. He made a mess. Remember the first yes. scene when he put he's got the he's got that amp out there. And he puts the fucking the can of paint on top of it, and he just jizzes fucking paint all over it. Oh, he doesn't care. Either. Like that's that's someone's shit, dude. Yeah. Um, he also is is very eighties. He's wearing a mesh tank top over a Batman shirt, <laughs> and Batman wasn't even out yet at that point. Yeah. So, so you know, hey, he, he's a comic fan. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, the, the supposedly when he was tried out for the part, he just showed up basically like that, and. They were like, oh, yeah, just wear, wear that, wear, wear like something like you'd normally wear. So he is basically just playing himself, essentially. Yeah. I had read that he showed up for that uh, right after filming uh, Dream, Dream a Little Dream. Okay. Which, by the way, it, like, we talk about our buddy Scary Larry Dwyer. Yeah. He has multiple times tried to convince me that that's the best of the Corey movies. I have been fighting with him for years about that. All right, real quick, Sean, ready? Yes. We're going to play this game. Let, let's just go three Corey movies. Yeah. Because it's it's really three that we all know of, right? Yep. I'm sure they did other like n- there was a National Lampoon's thing they did like when they were in their 30s. there were ones later on. Like let's talk about let's movies, talk about yeah. the three. Okay, Lost Boys, uh, Dream a Little Dream, License, License to Drive. To drive. Yeah. Okay, Sean, what order do you put those in? Best to worst, hundred percent number one, not even an argument. License to Drive. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, I I thought you were going another way, but I totally agree. No, the horror thing. Yeah, Lost Boys is two to me. Uh, Dream yep. of Dream barely rates. If I have to, it, it'd be three, obviously, but it okay. doesn't even belong on the list to me. Okay. I'm exactly the same. Like, uh, License to Drive, I loved that movie when I was a kid. That was, I watched it a, a lot. And I I love Lost Boys, too, but it's just a different. It holds up. License holds, to Drive holds up. Yeah. It's still funny. It, you know, and yeah, Dream of Little Dream is just, uh, yeah, I, it, I wouldn't say it's bad, but it's definitely not great i'm gonna go a little different i'm gonna go lost boys one license to drive which was the uh i, I keep my letterbox right like uh account the first movie me and my first movie i watched this year uh i think january 1st me and my wife watched it and i hadn't seen it in forever you're right it does hold up that's a good fucking movie it, yeah. it doesn't date itself that even though it's 80 was it 88 88 it's it's it right before date this. itself yeah like you think it would no you're absolutely right so i go i go with that and dream a little dream is a piece of shit <laughs> and if you notice something too what are the first two have in common that the third one doesn't Think about it. There was a dynamic they changed in the third one. Oh, um, Feldman was the he was the the main dude in Dream a Little Dream. Yeah. Haim was more of a main Haim dude. Haim was right. the main guy. Right. Haim, well, granted, in Lost Boys, Haim really isn't the main guy. But when you yeah. get to them, he's the main guy. And then Feldman's like kind of like the but lesser see guy. See what happens? You, you put Feldman on top, and he starts doing Michael Jackson dances in the movie. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. He's an ancillary character. Is how he plays best. Yeah. Like in this movie. He's in it very selectively, and but where where he's there, it's it's great. Right, even when he voiced a turtle, he was Donatello, <laughs> who is kind of like the ancillary turtle. Let's yep. be honest: if if you replaced any turtle tomorrow, yeah. nobody would notice it was Donatello. Right. We start digging; they don't find anything, but uh, and now everything's happening outside. Right, the pizza dude and the cops are showing up, and the neighbors are coming back, and Rumsfeld clumsily falls off his fucking roof. I'm going to tell you right now. 
as a guy in his 40s, even in great shape like he is in that movie, if he fell off his roof like that in, like, let's say, 55, 60, he's easily shattered many bones in his body. Oh, yeah. Well, he, yeah. he like, falls, like, three times in this movie. Yeah. He's doing all the physical yeah, he's comedy. He's clumsy for, you know, like, a special ops guy. You got to yeah. kind of wonder if that was, like, written into the story is that he's, like, He's not a super soldier. Like he's, well, he's probably, yeah. it's, it's a probably, you know, backstory. He probably was never in the military. He's yeah. just one of those guys. It's yeah. delusional. <laughs> yeah. I know a couple of those guys Yeah, <laughs> through my life. I've known a few of those guys. Those guys, those guys scare the fuck out of me, by yeah. the way. <laughs> but I feel like th- that's uh, Chef Andy. Uh, he, that's, that's basically Chef Andy. He, he'll just like fall off things and he like bounces back. I saw this dude fall out of a tree house in his yard that was 12 feet up in the air. And he had like a hammer and a two by four in his hand and like threw it and just landed flat. And I thought he was dead. And he just got up and just like started like back at work and was like, oh, that kind of hurt. And I was like, I seriously thought I was going to be like, go, like driving you to the hospital. Shake it off, Andy. Yeah. It, it, and that's not the first time he's fallen off a ladder or something. So he got, I, he got up. He made it like just certain people. I think he made the best rat tattoo you've ever had before. <laughs> Yeah. Look at that. He's all concussed. He's <laughs> he's doing it with muscle memory. He can't see. He's blind, but he's cutting the fucking eggplant. <laughs> yeah. But if you've fallen enough, I guess you're just used to, you know, it's like a professional wrestler. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Take what is that? Taking taking, taking your a hit, bump. Taking your bump. Taking That's what it is. Taking your bump. Yeah. All right. So Tom Hanks, uh, Ray Peterson, he's digging. He hits metal, right? He starts fucking clanking. Uh oh. He says to fucking uh to to art, I hit the fucking gas line. Now, this is important because they've got this fucking crematorium furnace going at a thousand. So they start running. And I'm thinking to myself, uh, I've never seen this movie before. I'm thinking, the house ain't going to blow up. Like, even as ridiculous as the movie is, I'm like, they're not going to blow this ho- this dude's house up. The fucking house explodes. Explodes. Uh, Art gets out, but we don't know if Ray gets out. Ray does end up getting out, but he's all fucked up. <laughs> um, and his eye is the best. His, his eye shut. is, he looks, like a, he looks like a boxer. His eye is yeah. shut. Yeah, he looks like a, from, uh, you know, Punch Out. He looks like yeah. a glass Joe. Glass Joe, yeah. yeah. I couldn't, you know, as, as dumb as it sounds, I couldn't figure out how that what happened would cause that injury. Yeah, yeah, that's it makes usually, no sense. That's usually a, like a direct contact like with a your two eye. Two by four went flying. <laughs> Something hit him, hit him in the him face. In the face. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he gets out and uh, and they get out to the street. The clo- the Klopex, Klopex come home and you know you've destroyed our house and you start to think, man, maybe they've been wrong about these guys all along because there's never really been solid evidence. Yes, we had a femur bone. We and Walter had come back. And as well. w- right, and Walter came back. Walter had had heart palpitations earlier in the week. His daughter took him. Um, the only part that I found unreal in the movie about that was that Walter was the kind of guy who would never leave his dog. Like he would yeah. tell someone, "You've got to yeah. take the dog." Right. Yeah. But also, who asked the the Klopex right. to pick up the mail? Yeah, who, they, who would have they're just them to do it. Yeah, they're just yeah. hanging out on the weekend. You know, the Klopex and Walter are just kind of <laughs> that, that's a whole other movie. Yeah. yeah. So the Klopex had his hairpiece because they've been taking his mail, so they didn't kill him. Art is still very braggadocious about, you know, um, about his, you know, what we did here. And Ray just fucking loses it, right? Because he's finally seen the light. He's been told this whole movie by his wife, like, get get your fucking head out of these people's asses. And he gets up and what does he tell himself? He's like, oh, we, we're not, they're not the crazy ones. We're the crazy ones. Right. Like, basically, you know, the, the neighbors no one likes, that, that's us, is what he says. We've blown up someone's fucking house. Yeah. That's what we did. <laughs> Yeah, and right. just loses his shit, which is one of my favorite parts of the movie. That and he earlier in the movie he loses his shit too, and like starts like smashing a beer can with his hands, like yeah. classic like Tom Hanks, just like losing it. Yeah. yeah. This, so this was his vacation, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and call from work. Yeah, you get the whole like stretcher gag where he's. Oh, that was hilarious. He, he, he's just. First of all, the two of them, they keep, like, fighting. He's, like, biting his finger and, yeah, like, yeah and then just jumps on the, the stretcher and he's throws sitting there. The ambulance. Yeah, well, no one's, like, moving it, so he picks it up, throws the ambulance, gets on, and he's just, like, yeah, he, twitching. He, he throws the gurney, the stretcher, into the ambulance, jumps on it, but he's face down on it, <laughs> and he's acting like a little kid kind of. He's just, like, laying there with his feet, like, kind of crossed at the bottom, and his wife was like, you know, what hospital are you going to? And he's like, I don't know. <laughs> he doesn't care. So they, they, they take him, they're going to take him off to the hospital, but before the hospital, before they get to the hospital, who jumps in, Sean, with him? The, the good doctor. The good doctor By jumps side. in. Right there. Right there. No one saw him get in. No one saw him get in. Yeah. Right? Or that Hans is driving either. Yeah. Yes, right. Hans is driving. <laughs> and uh, and they start taking off, and the doctor is like, you know, he fucked everything up, right? And this is where we get the point where even though we kind of realize it, I think, as an audience, but the doctor and, and Hans and 
Brother Theodore, what the fuck's his name? Reuben? Yeah, Reuben. <laughs> These are not good people. No. And he, he basically says, did you see the, you saw the bones. You saw the fucking, the skulls inside of my, uh, inside of my fucking Blastertronic 9000 furnace. And uh, Ray's like, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. And that's where he kind of lets out that, you know, yes, they have been killing people. Um, and then he's got a fucking needle and something nefarious that he's <laughs> going to put in Ray. Now, this is a crazy part. There's four different endings, I guess, to this movie. I did not read if they were all filmed or not. They, I know. I only know of the one, which is on the DVD. I, I have the DVD of this. I don't know if the, it's on the Blu-ray or not. But the original DVD has the altern, alternative ending. What happens in the alternative ending? Basically, nothing that great. They're like in. They're in the ambulance, and then they're making noise, and everyone goes over and opens the ambulance as he's. Sticking his, you know, trying to stick his uh, syringe into him. It's not very interesting, but uh, I, f- I forget what. Uh, oh, the, 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 then it goes on, and there's they make a bunch of jokes about like, uh, you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, Hans is like, oh yeah, like no one would have caught us if we were in L.A. or something. And and then and then Rumsfeld goes and he's like goes off to like bang his wife essentially. Okay. So <laughs> you can see why they went. They definitely went a better direction in this one. The ending we do get. There's a struggle. The stretcher uh, bit. Is the stretcher. Funny. Yeah. It's funny. It is funny. Yeah. There's a struggle. Um, the house ends up. Uh, people realize something's going on. The the van drives through a pizza dude. Or the, yeah, hits the pizza dude, then drives through Weingartner's house. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's his house, and uh, and essentially they 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 all get caught. Um, Hans almost gets away and someone screams out, what, uh, hey, Pinocchio. Yeah. Oh, it's hysterical. <laughs> I, he's, it's one of my favorite parts of the movie. Because <laughs> he's kind of dressed like he's got the shorts. Yeah. and the, Where he, are you going? Where are you going, <laughs> Pinocchio? Um, and, and he and, just slips. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And he falls right then and falls, there. falls, takes one step and slips backwards. <laughs> and, and we kind of get the typical Hollywood ending where, uh, you know, like Carol comes over and Ray says, you know, we're going to the lake tomorrow. Like, you know, essentially like, you know, you were right all along and, and my vacation is going to be used for something much better than this bullshit. But the ending that I think was only scripted, but not actually uh, filmed, and it was one of the endings, and it was an option, was where Hans uh, Klopek kills Ray hmm. in the van. Now, it didn't go much further than that. It said there was a scripted ending where he actually kills Ray. And I thought, <laughs> wow, I don't want to see that movie, but I also kind of want to see that movie. Yeah, that's a weird way to end it, though. Can you imagine people going to see The Burbs in 1988 and already being... Kind of maybe slightly misled into thinking this is a ha 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 Tom Hanks comedy. <laughs> yeah. And then through the course of the movie, you realize, okay, it's like a pseudo horror movie. Yeah. There's serial killers next door. It's not like laugh out loud funny. Oh, and then we kill fucking Tom Hanks at the end and the credits roll. <laughs> right? Yeah. How do you how, how do you feel <laughs> walking out of that movie with that ending? Sal, you're the fan of this movie, right? How, how would like what, trade those endings out? Where do you where how do you feel about the whole movie with that ending? It's a lot less funny. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I think it definitely is a whole different tone. It went but much it's almost, darker. <laughs> yeah, it's almost so absurd that it's like you kind of wonder, but I don't yeah, know. I that, don't that know. I had not heard. So that's you call me off guard on this one. Yeah, there, I had heard that they supposedly they were supposed to find the garbage man in the trunk of the car, which would have made you happy. Oh, I'm yeah, sure. yeah. <laughs> but, well, the way they were fucking acting about and I I do want to mention that the way that we basically pin this on the uh the Klopex is that uh, Ricky finds in the trunk of their car like fucking mass hysteria. <laughs> yeah. 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 More than just that family that owned the Right. House. That's like a whole neighborhood of people. It's a slayer fucking <laughs> album cover. Um and they and they and that was the other thing. They have admitted in uh, Hans admitted in the truck that uh, in the van that they didn't buy the house. They they basically it's it's almost like an X Files episode, or like that's a real horror movie thought about it. Here's this Tom Hanks ha 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 movie, and the plot revolves around these people that like come to your house and kill you for it because you won't sell. Because you won't yeah. sell. Because the house is so in such great shape, they yeah. don't want to get rid of it. And, and it's, yeah. they really do their homework. So it's such a great neighborhood where everyone keeps yeah. to themselves. Yeah. <laughs> Oof. All right. That's some. That yeah. It's it's an odd movie. This is an odd tonally. This is a hard one. Like. It's it's you can't pigeonhole the burbs. I don't so think so. That alternate ending where Ray dies. Yeah. So you know the original ending of Clerks, right? Yeah. Oh, I, I've seen that. Yeah. Which would be darker? <laughs> do you think Dante dying at the end of Clerks, Ray dying at the end of this one? Ray. 
Because even yeah. though Clerks is is Dante's not, a piece of shit, <laughs> and it's Tom Hanks, it's Tom it, Hanks. It's it's Tom Hanks audience expectation, right? You yeah. don't go to you know Saving Private Ryan. You can expect Tom Hanks to die probably heroically, heroically, yeah. right? Um, Forrest Gump, you don't expect him to die, or if he dies at the end, it's of old age or something, you know, heroically, like you said. The Burbs. You're you're already not really knowing what you're going into, and then he dies. Clerks almost feels like a very realistic slice of life, and uh, you know, unfortunately, a slice of realistic life in that lifestyle could be, you know, a stick up guy shoots you. You know, and Dante's not a good and and guy. Dante's no and really none, no none of them are none of them are. none of them are they're yeah they're they're all kind of self absorbed but. Yeah, well, she's great. she's going to get screwed over. <laughs> she's super great. <laughs> Thirty-seven dicks <laughs> in a row. In a row. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's let's grade this thing. Let's grade it. Uh, you know, oh fuck, did I hold on? No, let's not grade it. Let's do box office. I did put that down. I was like, I didn't do it for Sean's because there was no box office back in nineteen oh two. All right, so uh, uh, this came out on President's Day weekend. All right, big weekend for movies. Uh, We'll go 10 through 1. Number 10. It made $2.7 million that weekend. Harrison Ford, Melanie Griffith, Working Girl. Never saw it. Uh, 3.0 million. Uh, number 9. I have no clue what this is. I looked it up. I couldn't figure it out. True Believer. No clue. Not the Martin Sheen movie, The Believers, This uh, is which came out around the same time. Uh, number uh, number 8 that weekend, $3.1 million. Uh, the adaptation of Dangerous Liaisons. Mm -hmm. Number 7. Uh, $3.5 million, uh, Ted Danson, Cousins. I saw I saw that in the theater. Did you see Cousins it's in the theater? Totally not my age range either. Like, my demo, I don't know why. I ended up seeing that in the theater, though. Really? Yeah. I think we probably all have a movie like that if we dug in. We're yeah. like, why did I see that in the movies? I think we just wanted to get out, see a movie, just pick that one. It's Ted Danson. Cheers, yeah. Cheers was still on. Yeah, you're expecting, like, this kind of funny thing and yeah. not some guy. I think yeah. I think the plot is, I think he's, he's fucking, like, his cousin by marriage or something. Yeah, his wife's <laughs> fucking somebody, so he decides to try to fuck his cousin. Yeah. To get back. Which we all have been. We've been there. Totally. We've been there. <laughs> we relate to it. Sure. <laughs> uh, number six, 3.6 million. Uh, Sal, did you ever know that you're my hero? You know what that is? Uh, you're everything that I could dream to be. Come on, you're the wind under my what? I, I wind beneath my wings, but what is? Oh, what movie is Oof. that? Come on, come on! I've never seen it, but I even I know this. It's this another my, one I saw in the theater. Shawnee <laughs> theater. Shawnee Mac is like is like the woman's rom com <laughs> totally. guy. Wait, what? What movie is it? Peaches. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, four point three million dollars. Uh, number five. This is I haven't seen it in a long time, but this is a sequel. I think that. Doesn't get a lot of play. I, I remember enjoying this. The Fly 2 mm. with Eric Stoltz. I remember uh, I remember nothing and that was terrible. Uh, number four, $4.5 million. I think this is Nick Nolte and Martin Short, Three Fugitives. Oh, I, that's a good movie. Okay. So is that, am I correct who that is? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, and there's like a little girl. I, the, I definitely is, is, the, is the, She's third. the third fugitive. She's yeah. the third. Okay. <laughs> that's that's a pretty like Martin Short in that. It's in uh you know that era. Martin Short is a, a great era. As you mentioned, Inner Space, great, uh, great yeah. fun movie. Uh, number three, it made six million dollars. This was a huge hit that uh, came out of nowhere. San Dimas, High School Football Rules. Oh, yeah. Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Definitely saw that in the theater. Oh, I saw that in the theater yeah. multiple times. Uh, six point seven million dollars. Number two for the weekend. Tom Cruise, Dustin Hoffman, and a whole bunch of toothpicks on the ground. Rain Man. Wapner at 4 o'clock. Number one. $11 million opened that weekend at number one. Again, I would never believe this, but the Tom Hanks factor. The Burbs. Wow. The Burbs. Yeah, I don't remember it, it being in the theater at all, but, you know. Yeah. I I, I was only 12. The thing but. I remember the most about The Burbs is is the poster with him in the robe. and Yeah. Right? He's kind of standing there like this. and it, it, Almost like a horror movie poster. Yeah. In the background, it's dark, right? Yeah. We think of the same one or the sky. Oh, no. It's yeah. Quite, it's, it's like a dark it's sky, I think. It's blue kind of. Yeah. The yeah. Burbs and purple. House behind him. Yeah. 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 He's in pajama pants. Yeah. And. Absolutely. All right. Let's rate this. Let's start with Shawnee Mac. Sean, zero to five. Quarter and half scale optional. Okay. What do you give 1989's Tom Hanks starring The Burbs? Hmm. I mean, I, I certainly liked it. Um, it's different. It's original. Good cast. Yeah. Definitely good cast. Um, and it's got Feldman. So. The Feldman <laughs> factor. And Courtney Gaines. I will go uh, 3.75 out of 5. 
All right. It's out of five, right? Out of five. Okay, absolutely. There we go. Absolutely. All right, Sal, you're last because uh, this is this is your pick. I'll go next. Uh, I'll, this is a movie that my initial thoughts were um, raised a bit by our conversation. That happens a lot. That's why I never read a movie before we sit down because sometimes things get brought up and I think about them. I wasn't super high on this, to be honest with you, when I watched it. I enjoyed it. Really? But my first thought was, like, all these people that have been telling me I'm crazy, fuck you. Like, this is a good movie, but this isn't, like, I'm not missing out. But when you get to the conversation of, like, like the tone and the structure and what is this movie, it's intriguing as fuck. It has a great cast, okay? I think it's a little sloppy in how it's put together, you know? Like, it saves everything for the very end, like... You find out very quickly. It's almost like a Scooby Doo episode in some ways. Oh, definitely. Okay, but I did. It, it raises it up from where I was at. I don't go as high as Sean. I give this a solid three. I give it a three point oh. Really? Yeah. I think it's one of those movies. You know, you need to maybe watch it more than once. I mean, maybe I'm I'm biased here, but for me, like the plot is less the important part. It's more like all the other subtle things going on in there and all the gags and things. Whereas like the end is kind of like whatever other than Tom Hanks freaking out. Like I care less about the plot and more about just all the like wacky things going on. Yeah. You, you, you look at it almost as a series of vignettes and I kind of get that, but I also am looking for a complete movie experience, sure. but I, I, it, what does raise it as we talked is like, you can't pin this movie. Yeah. Right? Nobody is. I don't know if there's ever been a movie like The Burbs. Yeah. You know? I, I, it, right. And like you say, you may be like some of the things like the dog synth that you don't pick up the first time or like all the like camera close ups on the eyes with like the music and you hear like the say like the bells and things from, from like the old Western style and the whistling like sort of like pat in the spoof and everything there's always like little things the the soundtrack and everything that i feel like and again i i saw when i was younger so there's always going to be like a nostalgia factor but i definitely like it's one of those things where i've seen it many times and i watched it you know i hadn't watched it in a few years but i watched it again and i was like oh oh, oh, look this part and all all these little things that i almost forgot about fair so so what do you give so, it? Uh, but I will give it a four, only because I feel like anything higher, I, I part of me wants to say like 4.25, but I'm also like, let's face it, if you, it, I have to compare it to like a five movie or right. a, a higher movie. It's just, that's maybe a little more my nostalgia factor taking it in. So I feel like trying to be objective with still a little bias, I I think four. It's a weird bridge movie too because it came out in '89, and like it's hard to think like you. I tend to think myself of movies as it's an '80s movie or a '90s movie. Right. This is like a bridge movie. Like it's yeah. not an '80s movie. Right. It's it's got a lot of qualities of an '80s movie, but it's also not like I don't think of Batman '89 as an '80s movie. No. It came out in '89. Yeah. Because of the year, right? It, it seems like I don't know if that makes any sense, but. I don't assign that thought process to it. So 4.0, 3.75, 3.0. All right. Thank you for bringing the burbs on on this uh, third to last pint movie invitational. Sally, yeah. we got you in there. And glad we got you to see it finally. Yeah, no, I, I cannot I cannot say that any longer. You're crazy for not have seen it before. Come yeah, on. I'm, I'm absolutely nuts. I'm <laughs> You're absolutely nuts. nuts. You're nuts. Oh, man. You know how many years I got that with the Boondock Saints? Yeah. And then I watched the Boondock Saints, and I yeah. went, fuck you. I want to love I, that movie so bad. I will not ever say fuck you about the Burbs, because I did enjoy this experience. Yeah. But I do want to say again to everybody that used to tell me, watch the Boondock Saints, and you're crazy for not having seen the Boondock Saints. Fuck you. That movie is fucking hot, hot fucking garbage. <laughs> That's where I'm leaving that. It set. has its moments. Uh, hot but garbage. But yeah, it definitely overrated. Hot garbage. Sal, tell everybody again about Robert Barron's Inc. and where they can go and check you out. Uh, robberbaronsinc.com check us out we got t-shirts aprons bags uh, always putting out new stuff we're at conventions at fairs making the rounds but yeah yeah and if you want to uh head over there you can get your official pinto comics discount with the comic uh the promo code pinto Pinto. And that'll save you some percentage. Don't ask me what, though. Oh, but hey, anything anything <laughs> off is uh, is good. <laughs> save a little bit of money. So uh, one more time with the website. RobertBaronsInc.com. I-N-K. 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 And promo code Pinto. Pinto. Sean, thanks for sitting in on this one. 
Anytime. Like I said, it was great being back. Oh, it's awesome having you. Uh, you're still writing for Horror News Network, right? I am. Correct. Why don't you throw that website out there and it's tell uh, people to go check your stuff horror out? HorrorNewsNetwork.net, your one-stop uh, destination for all news, horror news, reviews, and everything else. You know where to find us on all your podcatchers. It's uh, Pint of Comics. Uh, Instagram, Pint underscore O underscore Comics. Twitter is at Pint of Comics. Facebook, Pint of Comics. Uh, that's really it. Sal, you listen to the show enough. You know what we say at the very end. Can you can you do the honor for I'd me? I'd be honored. See ya. It's over, Johnny. It's over. Nothing is over. Nothing. You just don't turn it off. <laughs>